Paul. Hi, Paul. Paul, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling fine. Right? You're feeling okay. fine? Why don't uh, we take a little ride? We would like you to have a medical examination. Just you can't do that, sir. Here. Okay? Okay. We got a psychiatrist. Well, here. we. I'm sorry, I don't know the okay. psychiatrist. Okay, I can. Uh... Would you say that you don't want that, please? Because I honestly don't know you. I know you don't know me, Paul. I do. I have, honestly don't uh, know you, sir. Would you please let me alone? Would you like to see some ID? I have, I have an ID. Paul has committed no crime, yet he's been taken to hospital against his will. He's one of the thousands of mentally ill people freed from institutions in America who are now living on the streets. He's a victim of a good idea which went wrong. I'm sorry, I'm not a lunatic. I don't need psychiatric care, sir. All right, well, you will have I have more than five dollars on me. When you, okay, What's when the legal By being treated as normal and living in the community, Paul is expected to control his own life. But can he? Lorraine is very ill, but her case is by no means unique. Take any area in Britain, and you will see the same dark pattern of a powerful illness and its neglect. Schizophrenia, like any other mental illness, acts as a kind of fifth column. Because of the stigma, it moves secretly underground. You never know whom or where it will strike. But you can be sure that it will claim one in a hundred victims, and that means hundreds and thousands of households. Over the past five years, I've met many schizophrenics and their families and investigated the help, or lack of it, that they receive. And what's so distressing is it doesn't seem to matter whether I'm in an inner city, such as London or Liverpool, a wealthy suburb, seaside resort, or rural village, the litany of suffering is the same. It's the repetition of the stories, the uncanny similarities, the inexorable way in which innocent people are turned into guilt-ridden casualties that so appalls. And yet everybody seems to stand back, unable to save them. If there's anybody else there, he's perfectly normal. As he says, it's, I can behave all right if I have to. And he does, and you wouldn't know there's anything wrong with him. When, the minute we're alone, he absolutely changes. I can only to say, uh, suggest that it's diabolical possession. It, it really is like that. He, his eyes change, his face disintegrates, um, veins come out, he's half bald, veins come out in his head and throb. Great sobs come up from absolutely from his feet. And he sits there saying, Oh, Mother, I'm so sorry. And I sit facing him. And there we are. And how long does that go on? Why do you sit there? Oh, because it, it's impossible. If you think of the mechanics of it, it's impossible to commit suicide with somebody else sitting there. It just gets progressively worse. You start off with hope. He goes in for treatment, he comes out, and you hope that everything is going to be fine. But after a little while, you find it isn't, and he has to go back in for more treatment. Again, he comes out, and again, you hope. You find him a job. But after a few weeks, he cannot carry on with the job. So you sink back into apathy. You get no outside help. He goes back in for more medication, gets balanced, comes out, and it all starts all over again, and again, you hope because that is all you have, is hope that it will improve, but it doesn't. The aftercare isn't there. There's no compulsion on them. They're voluntary patients. They please themselves whether they take their medication or not. When they've had enough, they say, I'm having no more tablets, no more injections. Then they start to go downhill. You can see it happening, but if you go to a, a doctor or psychiatrist and say, look, my son needs help, Oh, I don't think so, Mr. Wiggenden. Carry on. And you carry on, knowing that he's going to go down and down and down until eventually you reach the bottom and he has to go in again. He feels resentment because you put him in. He accuses my wife of always taking him back to hospital. It's your fault I'm in there, Mother. You always take me back. But what else can the poor soul do? You cannot put up with him at home as he is. He needs help, he needs treatment but he doesn't get it until you get him in. 
and then the awful round starts again, the revolving door. You get him in, they get him balanced, they turf him out. He's unable to work, he's unable to do a normal person's behavioural attitudes, even for a few hours. He can swing from one to another, just like that. You lick and you sit on tenterhooks waiting to see what's going to happen. You cannot hold a normal conversation. You have to think twice about everything you say, think or do before you utter anything. You'll take it out of context, throw it back in your teeth, and then it becomes a record and you've heard it so many times that you say, for God's sake, you know, break that record, but he never does. He just goes on and repeats and repeats and repeats what he's told you for centuries. It seems like the same old story, I've lost my wife, I've lost my children, I've lost my home, I've got nothing. People I went to school with have cars, are successful, their family life is happy. What have I got? Nothing. But you've heard it so many times that you, you eventually shut your ears to it because you cannot listen anymore. You had more than enough. And you too hit the bottom. And you think, God, if only he were dead, I could cheerfully bury him. And then everyone would be out of worry, trouble. There'd be no more. Either for him, my wife, or myself, it would all be solved. But it doesn't happen. He goes on, we go on, but for how long? I don't know. We're getting older, we're retired. What happens when we go? Who will look after him? No one. The plight of the mentally ill has become an international scandal. In America, the birthplace of the civil liberties movement, the situation has become so urgent that they've been forced to react. Last October, the mayor of New York sent out teams of psychiatrists and social workers to hunt through the streets and parks for people living rough. I joined Project Help on a routine search. This is the first time that any camera crew has been allowed to witness their work. What if we leave a lunch for later just in case you change your mind? The teams have power to take those judged in need of psychiatric care to hospital for assessment, often against their will. Goodbye, Pete. Goodbye. We tend to forget that no one is free while at the mercy of his own fears and fantasies. The real prison is the illness itself. 